Hey everyone, let's take a look at some animation tools in Blender. Tools that are actually friendly to us 2D artists. We built this scene largely with 2D skills we already have, but applied in Blender. Check out parts 1 and 2 if you haven't already. We'll finish this scene today with some 3D and 2D animation. This series is brought to you by Acer's Concept D, a new line for creator PCs. I'm using the Concept D7 easel for all the art in this series, and I'll show you some of my favorite aspects of this machine along the way. So here's our scene as we left it in part two. And one thing I'd really like to do is get a depth of field effect. You know, like my intro shot, how the background is blurry. I'll show you how to do this with a dummy scene here. I'll push numpad zero to click into the camera view. Turn on viewport shading with this button here. Click on the camera in the outliner. Then go down here and click on the green camera icon. Turn on depth of field and unfurl this. I like to use the sample tool here to pick the focus object. Then use the f-stop slider to get the blur. This happens to be the maximum blur I can get. If I want more, I have to scale the scene, but that's easy. Press A to select everything, then S for scale. And as I scale my scene, we can see the blur increasing. It's a nice filmic effect, but trying it in our scene, there's a problem. Grease pencil objects, unfortunately, don't react to depth of field. For example, the foreground gate should be blurred out here. We'll solve this at the end by rendering in layers and compositing. To prepare for that, we need to organize this scene. As you can see, my outliner is a mess. Right click anywhere in the outliner and you can make a new collection. This is a group that houses objects. Then I'll shift select all my snowflakes in this case, push M and I can move these to the snowflakes collection. Another way to quickly do this, you can shift select some objects, right click, say move to collection, then say new collection and go ahead and create one. All right, so I've gone ahead and done that for all the stuff in my scene, and I've got a nice clean Blender file to show for it. Let's figure out a camera move now. If you aren't already looking through the camera, press the tilde key and say view camera, push N to bring up this side menu, go into this tab and make sure camera to view is checked on. That makes it so when you use your navigation controls, you know, middle mouse button with shift or control, we are actually moving the camera object through 3D space, as you can see in the right panel there. This means we can keyframe its orientation. The first step is to pick the object you want the camera to look at. I want it to be the main tombstone, so I'll select it and push numpad period. Now the camera is always aiming at that object. By the way, if you're on a laptop and don't have a numpad, enable emulate numpad in the preferences. So the first step of my camera move here is to find the starting position. Actually, at this point, you might want to consider your final aspect ratio. Go into this panel here, and you can adjust the X and Y dimensions. All right, so with the camera selected, and I'm at frame one here in the timeline, push I for the keyframe menu, and we'll key the location, then press I again, and key the rotation as well. Then in the timeline, I'll go to frame 96, which is four seconds long at 24 frames a second, go ahead and find an end point for the camera move, something that shows off the three-dimensional nature of the scene, then press I for the keyframe menu, and this time we can just say available, which adds a keyframe to what you've already keyed. So now I can scrub the timeline and see the animation, or go to frame one and push shift spacebar to see it play in real time. You could also use the play controls here. All right, so now that we're in the world of animation, let's get those snowflakes falling. As you recall from part two, each little section of snowflakes is an individual grease pencil object. I can simply animate those moving downward. One quick tip, turn on the auto key button here, then I'll just nudge this object and Blender will automatically set a keyframe. Then move to another frame, move the object, and Blender sets another keyframe automatically. That's what those yellow diamonds are, by the way. You can move your keyframes around manually by clicking and dragging them in the timeline. So look at this, my snowflakes are falling. And if you're wondering if the Concept D is powerful enough for this type of work, I'm getting real-time previews with Eevee no problem. And that's while screen recording as well. Okay, one thing about this snowflake animation, I'll convert this window into a graph editor, and here we can see the snowflake's downward motion represented. By default, the motion accelerates and decelerates, which of course is unnatural for snowflakes. This line should be linear. With each keyframe, I'll just grab these handles and drag them in. Or if you want it perfectly linear, select a keyframe and press V and change the handle type to vector. Stylistically, one thing you might want to try with your grease pencil objects is give them a noise modifier. You can adjust the amount of noise here. Now watch the left gate object as I play the animation. It's got a bit of wobble to it. It might help add interest to a moving painting, especially if I'm blurring that out in post. Okay, it's time to put a character in there, and I'm gonna do it with Blender's 2D animation tools. When you open Blender, you can choose a 2D animation workspace. 
This is what the layout looks like. And of course, the idea here is you can draw a frame, change your frame down here in the timeline, and continue drawing frames until you have an animation. Auto key is turned on, and that's what makes this possible. Just like other modes, use F to change your brush size, which you could also do up here with this slider. This slider here is opacity. These buttons toggle pen pressure. In my timeline, I'll zoom into my keyframes by dragging this bar, and I can just click and drag them to change the timing of my animation. Shift spacebar to play and shift spacebar to stop. All right, by default, onion skinning is active, which are those transparent previews of neighboring keyframes. Go into the grease pencil menu here, and you can control their opacity as well as how many keyframes before or after it displays. You can toggle onion skinning altogether with these icons here. So Blender gives you two layers, which it has pre-named lines and fills. Those layers can be interacted with up here. We'll further explore this area a bit later. So the character I'll be animating is my unpaid intern. Intern, what have you done? Which you might recognize from my 10 minutes to better painting series. Now it'll be useful to have a background image to draw on top of. So I'll find a frame somewhere in the middle of my camera move, go to render, render image and save this out. Now I've started a brand new 2D animation Blender file. It looks different, but this is just a normal Blender scene, as you can see here. It's just a camera looking at a grease pencil object. So I'll switch into object mode, add my background image using images as planes, just like I did in part two. There it is, and I'll push S to scale it up a bit. Then I can go back into the camera view, select my grease pencil object up here, tab back into draw mode, and I can basically start animating. I want that background reference to be more faded though. So I'll switch back into object mode, middle mouse navigate out here, select my background and go into the materials tab. Change our usual emission shader to a mix shader. That gives us two shader slots here. Change the first shader back to emission, set the color to an image texture, and you'll find the BG reference preloaded here. So I'll collapse this first shader. Then the second shader is just set to emission. And here I can just play with the color. I'll choose white, of course. Then I have this handy little strength slider to mix them. Now I can go back into the camera view with numpad zero, set the mix shader to my liking, select the grease pencil object back into draw mode. And here we go, I'm ready to start animating. All right, just a quick aside. When drawing for animation, you wanna make sure your characters have very simple underlying shapes. The intern's head is basically a bunch of circles and his body is equally simple. You can see here, I'm able to define a whole side of his body with just one line. That makes animation a lot easier. A simple design means your forms are easier to track from frame to frame. The Concept D is a joy to work with. The mechanics of the easel allow for many different screen rotations and it always feels solid, no flimsy wobbling of the screen. All right, so there's my basic character design. And because he's outdoors, I'll have to fit him with a jacket, something like that. Maybe some mitts too. All right, so my animation process is quite improvisy. In animation lingo, this is something called a straight ahead approach. Basically, I'll start with a pose that I think should probably be there. In this case, it's the character walking up to the main tombstone. It's important to me that this drawing tells the story of the shot. You know, how he's feeling, a sense of how he's moving. Keep it rough. Now I've switched to another frame and I just wanna get this guy moving. I'll start with the onion skin, but I generally find that distracting. I'm evaluating the movement by flipping frames, which you do with the left and right arrow keys. The pose I'm going for here is the next position in his step forward. And just a reminder, this is a digital process. I can switch into edit mode, marquee select my entire drawing, moving it a bit by pressing G, then go back into draw mode. This process is called straight ahead because, well, you start with a pose and work straight ahead from that. The other way of working is when you rough out all the major poses for the shot, then progressively break those down with in-betweens. Both are viable workflows. It's just here, I think the motion is simple enough that I can improvise my way through it. If you want to move every frame of your animation all at once, switch into object mode, push G, and now you'll be moving the entire grease pencil object, which contains all your frames. And now, of course, I've switched back into draw mode. However, I made a mistake there. You should turn off auto key when you do a global edit like that. Otherwise, your entire animation will slide around. Now, these drawings are just guesses at what I think the motion would be. Probably I'll get some of these drawings wrong and have to redo them. That's another reason to not commit to your drawings at this early stage. I have also not timed anything out yet. As you can see, my keyframes are all clumped together at the beginning of the timeline. I'll try timing them out once I feel like I have enough drawings to work with. And that's also when I'll discover what's working and what's not. Here I'm adding a frame that occurs before my first drawing, 
just to give him a slight pause before he goes into the walk. I drew his torso too long on this frame, so remember, you can always go into sculpt mode and edit your drawing this way. Here's another cool sculpt mode feature. If I create a blank frame here, Blender automatically holds the previous frame, but when I apply a sculpt stroke, it duplicates that previous frame, but with my sculpting edits. So this is a great way to move one part of the body while keeping the rest of the drawing a held cell. All right, so I've got 18 or so drawings there, enough to drag them around the timeline and figure out the timing for this motion. The drawings do not have to be spaced equally here. There might be a two frame gap between drawings or a gap of three frames, six frames, 10 frames. This timing part of the process is just as creative as the drawings themselves. And for me, this is a rewarding phase because it's finally where I get to push play and actually see the character come to life. So I'll be silent for a second. Here's the timing I've come up with. Oh, and if you're wondering, I didn't draw his feet because he'll be behind the hill. So the current next step is for me to fill in these in-betweens. And I don't mind being a bit frugal here. For example, there's a five frame gap between these two poses, but it's not that big of a movement. I probably only need one drawing in there. Over here, there's another five frame gap, but that's a pretty dramatic change between those two drawings. So I'll probably want at least two in-betweens there. And by the way, I'm not adhering to any standards on ones versus twos. I'll just put more drawings where I think I need them and then evaluate whether the shot looks right. And if you noticed, I used the sculpt mode trick to help me position this in between. Oh, and one important navigation tip. When your keyframes are spaced apart on the timeline like I have them now, you can use the up and down arrow keys to jump between them. Okay, so here's one way to clean up your drawings. In the layers panel here, click on the plus icon to add a layer. I'll call this clean up. Then on my original lines layer, I'll decrease the opacity with this slider here. Then click back into my cleanup layer. Remember to uncheck use lights. Then I'll do my cleanup drawing on my cleanup layer. This is just like how a traditional cleanup artist would do this. You know, with a blank sheet of paper and a light box. I'm actually not much of a cleanup guy, so I will probably just keep my rough animation there. I think that might look nice. All right, let me show you now the coloring process. I'll want to be on my fills layer, of course. Uncheck use lights. Now, somewhere along the way, I lost my fills layer down here in the timeline. That's because it doesn't have any keyframes. So I'll push I and insert a blank keyframe, and magically the layer is back. I like to use the same regular pencil tool for my color fills, and to do that, you gotta change this from solid stroke to solid fill. Your color palette is here, but you need to enable this button to use it. Then just pick a color and draw the area you want filled. Simple as that. I'll make myself a custom palette here by clicking this button and renaming it. Then if I have a color I like, I can just press the plus button. Then maybe use it, go back in here, find another color, press the plus button, and build out my palette this way. However, a more streamlined way to do it is come up with an approved color model first. I did this one in Photoshop and imported it with images as planes. Now back in my animation grease pencil object, I'll go to my palette and erase these colors with the minus button. Then I can click on the color box and use the sample tool to sample individual colors from my color model and add them to my palette. I'll go ahead and do that for every color in the character. Then when I'm done, I push this shield button to save the palette. And yes, those jacket colors are a nod to Hogarth Hughes. I love that movie. All right, so I've done the animation. Now in my original scene, I go to File, Append, select my animation project file, click into the G Pencil folder, and there should only be one item here. So go ahead and append that. And the animation has come in somewhere, seems to be off to the left. So I'll drag it in. Open a new window and position the element where it should go. You can scale, rotate, move, just the same way we've placed every other element in the scene. And of course, I can scrub the timeline now and watch this thing play right in front of my eyes. This is real time, no lag. This is a pretty cool moment for me, seeing all that work we've done finally coming together. Okay, but there's a scale issue. The character's scale is okay at the end, but he should be smaller here at the beginning. So I'll find a frame where he's just finishing his walk, this is where the scale is correct. So I'll push I and set a scale and a location keyframe. Then I'll turn on auto key and go back to the beginning of his walk, right about there. With the character selected, I'll scale and move him to where I think he should be. Scrub the animation and evaluate. Now it does look like he's sliding a little bit, which means my location key is a bit too aggressive. So I'll go back to the keyframe and adjust, push play. And okay, that looks pretty good. I don't love how this gravestone is covering him up at the beginning though, so I'll just move it around and adjust. I'm in edit mode here, moving the grease pencil snow. There we go, now he passes behind the gravestone as he walks. 
All right, let's finally render this. You'll want to go to this tab and make sure Z is checked. Otherwise, the grease pencil stuff won't work. Now, Eevee has some built-in color adjustments. You can play with the contrast level, exposure, gamma, even some curves. So you could render this all at once, set the frame numbers here, as well as the frame rate. Then down here, I can choose one of the video formats, pick a file destination, then go up here and say render animation. And there's the old Concept D chugging out frames. Now, I don't wanna do it this way. I want some post-production control. Remember how I organized all this? So the checkbox here toggles visibility, but this camera button toggles renderability. With this off, as you can see, the foreground doesn't render. So I can isolate my elements this way. I've made a whole bunch of folders, and I'll turn off all renderability except for the sky. Then I'll set it to render to my sky folder, change my render format to PNG, no compression, and turn on RGBA. And this is important, go up here, under the Film tab, check Transparent. Then go to Render Animation, and there's the sky. The result is a folder full of numbered frames. Here's the snowflakes layer on that transparent background. Simply repeat the process for every element. I'll start a new Blender scene now and flip over to the Compositing tab. Check Use Nodes and delete this guy with X. Then go to Add Output Viewer and go ahead and drag this over. Okay, here's how you add your layers. Go to Add Input Image Sequence. I'll start with the base layer, which is the sky, and we get this node representing the sky layer. Connect the image slot to the corresponding slots on both of these nodes, and that viewer node gives us a live preview. I'll change the end frame here to 140, matching our renders, reframe the timeline. I can also right click and rename the image nodes, just to keep things clear as I work. Okay, so middle mouse button will move your nodes, and go into the view tab here to adjust the image preview. Okay, to add my next layer, I'll go and grab the image sequence, put it over here near the sky. Now we need something to connect it to. I'll disconnect these, then go up to Add Color Alpha Over. This node combines two layers. Bottom layer goes here, top layer goes here. Then I can reconnect the image slots, and there's our composite. Now the edge is very ugly. That's an easy fix. Just drag this slider to the right. Okay, just a workflow tip. Disconnect this, then shift right click through this line and connect it up this way. Okay, great. So I'll get the next layer, rename it, and go to this alpha over node and push shift D to duplicate it. Just drag it so it interrupts this line, then plug this layer in. And there we go, that's how you build it up. So I've done that for every layer and I have a caterpillar of nodes. Now I can do some post processing. I'll go up to add filter blur and put this node right after my BG graves. Now I can go in here and tweak these blur values. And look at that, I've got a nice cinematic blur on those background gravestones. I can copy that blur node with shift D and drag it over here to my background trees. Tweak the blur values and get a live update. I'm starting to get a nice look here. This is my blur node for the foreground gate. Now I can animate these values. On this frame, I'll right click and say insert keyframe for both X and Y blur. Then over on this frame, when we're much closer to the gate, I'll increase the blur and set another keyframe. This adds a nice subtlety to the shot. Watch this, here's that atmospheric layer. I'll go to Add Color Exposure, drag the node in here, and I can play with this value. Let's also grab a Hue Saturation node, drag it after the exposure, and now I've got a whole slew of color options. Compositing really is an essential and creative part of the workflow. So our caterpillar has become a labyrinth, and we are ready to render. We just use the same settings we've been using, and go up to Render Animation. And we have come to the end. Let's enjoy the final shot. I really hope this series has inspired you to take your 2D skills into Blender. There are endless possibilities to explore. Thanks to my patrons for your generous support, Concept D for sponsoring the series. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.